And now, uh, let me hand over to uh, Andrew. So some of you may remember Andrew's first presentation, which was about um, flags uh, a few years back now, maybe. I have no sense of time since all of this started. Didn't really have a sense of time beforehand. Um, but uh, yeah, Andrew's knowledge of flags is, is pretty extraordinary. And so I'm quite keen to see whether his uh, uh, knowledge of national anthems uh, can match it. So over to you, Andrew. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, I uh, cannot share my screen just yet, but I'm sure. In the meantime, um, I'll be giving you a brief introduction to national anthems, um, kind of a brief history of them, what's in them, uh, what they're all about. Um, and uh, I, I can't share my screen at the moment, uh, host disabled participant. Okay, we're, yeah, uh, we're working on it, Evie, <laughs> I think it's going to add you as a, as a host. Brilliant. Shortly. Sorry, everyone. We're um, the after a summer break. But yes, I'll, I'll waffle on for a bit. Um, yeah, so uh, my the national anthems, I mean, ev everyone's got a national anthem. We very seldom know anything about our own, let alone uh, anyone else's, but they're some of the most kind of emotive songs that there are. Uh, so without further ado, I think I am good to go. Right, so national anthems, let an impure blood water our furrows. That is an actual line from the Marseillaise, the national anthem of France. Um, now, uh, it is a talk on national anthems, so it is only appropriate that I do ask you to uh, get up off your couch and uh, rise for the national anthem. <laughs> Okay, so what was that? Um, obviously, we all know the tune to God Save the Queen, um, but uh, that was most definitely not God Save the Queen. That was actually Oben am Jungen Rhein. It is the national anthem of Liechtenstein, um, which makes it really very confusing when uh, England plays Liechtenstein in football. Um, so how did this happen? And uh, to answer that, we have to delve a bit into the history of national anthems uh, going right back to the 16th century. And that's enough of that. But that uh, hymn, uh, rousing, if you will, uh, is the national anthem of the Netherlands. It is Het Wilhelmus or the Wilhelmus. Uh, and this is the oldest national anthem in the world um, by some accounts. Um, it dates from the Dutch Revolt. So the Netherlands was rebelling against Spain back in 1568. Sometime between 1568 and 72, this hymn was written. It's very interesting uh, in its words and its history. Um, it's written in the first person as if it's William of Nassau, who's the leader of the revolt. And essentially what he's saying is, um, you know, I really want to be loyal to the King of Spain, but um, I have to be, uh, you know, I have to be loyal to my people. I have to be loyal to God. So um, sorry, King of Spain. Um, but anyway, uh, it, it, strange as that is, that song became immensely popular amongst the Dutch populace. Um, they were, they sung it going into battle. Um, I mean, how you're going to march to that is beyond me, but it was played at diplomatic events. And this song kind of was the first sort of unofficial national anthem. Um, and it came to sort of embody uh, what was the Dutch Republic at the time. Now, it was actually replaced after the Napoleonic era um, with a, a rather racist national anthem. Uh, but fortunately, in 1932, they reinstated Het Wilhelmus. Um, and this is the oldest national anthem. But to kind of get, a, a, get to a point where national anthems kick off a bit more broadly, uh, we need to go a bit closer to home. Oh, <laughs> 
Right, so we all know that aside from possibly the longest 15 seconds of my life, that is God Save the Queen, the national anthem of the United Kingdom. Actually, God Save the King, as it was written, the original first line was God Save Great George, our King. Uh, so this is actually, re uh, it's, it's a reaction to the Jacobites. Um, so that's the House of Stuart who were um, deposed in the Glorious Revolution. In 1745, Charles Edward Stuart, Bonnie Prince Charlie, the Great Pretender, whatever you want to call him, he lands in Scotland, raises an army, wins some battles, marches down into England, and he makes it as far as Derby. Um, at this point, uh, London is getting quite concerned. Uh, in... 1745 in in a theater um someone well a, a group sang this song and it took off like wildfire um again i guess back in the 16th 17th century people were really into slow dirges um but anyway it becomes very popular it starts being sung in all the theaters in London, people start singing on the street, and then it becomes nationwide, and it kind of becomes a Hanoverian rallying cry. Um, the song sticks. So after the Jacobites are defeated, that, that's the key thing. They keep the song. The, the royal family love it. The Hanoverians like it because it's, you know, the country are singing about them. They're singing about how they're so great. Um, why wouldn't they like it? So this starts being played at uh, diplomatic uh functions and and that sort of thing and what's really key about god save the king is that other european monarchs want in on this they're like well why why aren't my people singing about me so you have this tune this rousing dirge rewritten to suit um loads of different countries um one of those was Liechtenstein, and um they've actually kept it up until this day uh but this was applied to russia there was god save the, J the czar in 1871 when germany's unified um they they have uh they rewrite the words and use this tune as well um other royal houses uh, end up writing their own royal anthems. So the Marcha Real, which is still the national anthem of Spain to this day, uh, is written in the 1780s. Um, and it's uh, it this this is kind of your first growth of national anthems across Europe. But um, like I said, a bit of a dirge. So I'm going to indulge myself for a second and play you my favorite uh, clip from any movie ever. And this is a real national anthem. <laughs> What a national anthem, the only time France beat Germany in that war, I believe. Um, so that's, of course, the Marseillaise. It is bloody. It is rousing. Let the blood and impure blood water our furrows. It talks about bloody banners, all sorts. It's written in 1792, uh, towards the beginning of the French Revolution, to rally French troops in the war uh, against Austria. Um, which is why it's so bloody. Um, it gets its name, actually, because there was a contingent of troops from Marseille right in, on the Mediterranean coast, marching all the way to Paris uh, to, to join the fight. And they sang this all the way up, becomes immensely popular across the country. But what's really key is this is the first time a national anthem is adopted officially. Uh, the French Republic decrees it, um, puts it in legislation on Bastille Day in 1795. Um, they do abandon it, France, uh, under Napoleon and uh, under subsequent monarchs. Um, no surprise there, but it is uh, readopted. Uh, with the Third French Republic. What's really key, though, about the Marseillaise is that uh, it 
becomes associated with revolution. So this is a revolutionary tune. So other revolutionary movements want a song like this. They want something to, to rouse their people and uh, throw off the yoke of the oppressor. Um, and that takes us across the Atlantic to Latin America. The French Revolution inspires a lot of the revolutions in Latin America to some extent. Nationalism is born and loads of new states are created in Latin America. You go from Spain and Portugal controlling the whole of it to Spain and Portugal controlling none of it uh, in, in a very short space of time. And Latin Americans are broadly, uh, their anthems are broadly written between around 1810 and 60. Um, but what's really great is the Latin Americans commissioned actual composers to write their anthems. God Save the Queen is just kind of a, a folk song that someone put some words to. Um, but the Latin Americans go all in. And at the time, opera is especially popular, especially in Southern Europe. That's where all the immigrants are coming from to Southern to South America at the time. As a result, Latin American anthems are operatic in style. They have these long flowery introductions. They change a load. They're, uh, they're not really interested in you being able to sing along, but they are great fun. Um, I'm just going to play you a clip from the World Cup final in 2014 to give you uh, a quick example of this. So you will notice there, the uh, players and the coaches are not singing. It is not because they're miserable fuckers. It's because that's actually just the introduction. Argentina's national anthem is super long, but that that bit doesn't actually have any words. But you saw the crowd. They're going nuts. They're jumping. They're humming along at the top of their lungs. If a national anthem can do that before it even gets to the words, that is a good national anthem. But anyway, I move on back to the French Revolution. Obviously, it doesn't just... Uh, inspire Latin America, nationalism kind of explodes out of this and it spreads across Europe like wildfire. And uh, the states of Europe, largely the, the new ones, follow the French example, Belgium, Greece, they, they adopt national anthems on independence. Um, but what you, what you also have is kind of this explosion of songs that are like nationalist songs to go with the nationalist feeling of the time. So you have all these songs praising the beauty of the country or the beauty of the people's women or this and that. Um, so you end up in a situation where you kind of have each country has this sort of little mini songbook of popular songs and one eventually becomes more popular than the others and kind of eventually de facto becomes the national anthem. So that happens across Scandinavia. This also happens in the United States and Canada that's how they get their national anthems as well. Um, you also, with the revolutions that are happening at the time, nationalist songs are written that are later adopted as the national anthem. So Poland's anthem dates from the French Revolution. Um, Italy's and Slovakia, Germany, they're from the revolutions of 1848, um, and they are later adopted on independence or unification. But um, at your, you're in a position then at the end of the First World War where um, you essentially have national anthems in Europe, sort of, some, some, some official, some not, and in the Americas. But other than that, national anthems are not really a thing and something then changes. And that is the Olympics, actually. Uh, in 1920, the Olympics in Antwerp, they introduced national anthems in the medals ceremonies. Um, now, previous to this, national anthems are played at certain state events and diplomatic functions and that sort of thing. But suddenly, anthems are on the world stage. And you can imagine if everyone else had a song and you just won a gold medal and you're stood up there on the podium and they're raising the flag and they're not playing anything, it's a little bit awkward. Um, and, and it's actually the Olympics that sort of forces um, a couple of things. First of all, it sort of 
forces countries to choose their national anthem. So those de facto anthems actually kind of become official or, or become played and accepted as the national anthem. But what it also does is it kind of makes it essential to have a national anthem if you're an independent country. Sort of the independent statehood toolbox includes a national anthem. So from this point on, most new states will then have an anthem very shortly after independence, if not before. And then, of course, uh, after World War II, you have decolonization. Um, waves of independence sweep across Africa, the Caribbean, Asia, Oceania, 86 states um, between 1946 and 94, and that's 86 new anthems. And lots of these countries had anthems ready to go. They were oven ready national anthems, if you will. Um, some of them had independence movements, had anthems or songs that then became the anthems. Um, Nkosi Sikaleli, which is, uh, the, was the song of the ANC, uh, becomes adopted in a, as a part of the national anthem of South Africa after apartheid. They merge it with the, the apartheid national anthem, but that song kind of becomes uh, synonymous with African independence, and, and that tune is used as the national anthem of several other countries as well. Um, and we're now at a point where there is no sovereign state that does not have a national anthem. So what do national anthems speak or sing, I guess, about. So if you bear with me, I just need to do a technical thing. And you should be able to see more clearly now. Um, so key themes kind of exist. Most national anthems uh, will talk about something that's on your screen right now, unity of the people, how beautiful the country is, how, how they struggled for independence, martyrdom, um, God, working for a bright future, those sorts of things. And actually, if um, if you take the time to analyze every national anthem's lyrics, which I'm sure we all um, do, right? Uh, you, you find there's some consistency in regional messaging. So Latin America, for example, their anthems uh, tend to talk about the struggle for independence or defense of the country. Um, liberty, libertad in Spanish is in like every anthem in Latin America. Um, whereas if you look at the Middle East, a lot less liberty, a lot more defensive country, also a lot of blood. One in three national anthems in the Middle East mentions blood. Um, it's the highest proportion, um, well, the highest region. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa, a lot of talk about the unity of the people, which makes sense because essentially Europeans drew a line and created a country with, say, 82 ethnic groups and languages. Uh, so suddenly you're the Democratic Republic of the Congo. You probably want to talk about how you're all united as Congolese. Um, meanwhile, the Caribbean and Oceania, very little anger or, or defense uh, or blood, but lots and lots of God. They love a bit of God in the Caribbean and Oceania in their national anthems. So um, just a few examples there. Also, great consistency in musical styles. So virtually every national anthem is a hymn or a march. Hymns in the dark blue, marches in the orange. That gray slice, those are hymn march hybrids. Uh, your, your, really, your exceptions to that are the operatic anthems, which is pretty much exclusively Latin America. Throw in Italy and Monaco to that. Um, and then you have your outliers, which are actually really interesting. They tend to be in South, South, East Asia, and they tend to be quite poetic, and the music tends to be, um, actually, if, if you listen to certain versions, they're actually really interesting, it's really good to listen to, but they don't necessarily translate very well uh, into orchestra and, um, let's say, like, playing on a medals podium. So they might sound a bit awkward there, but actually end up quite cool if you listen to them as they're meant to be listened to. So why have a national anthem? What do they talk about? Well, they are meant to inspire reverence. Um, this is one of the reasons there's so many hymns. Uh, hymns inspire reverence, marches, you're marching for your country. So you're inspiring unity, you're creating a sense of belonging. And, and especially for your new countries from World War II onwards, you're kind of creating a sense of nationhood where there wasn't one before. Um, you're a national anthem sends a message to the world about what a nation is about, but 
key, I mean, national anthems are sending a message internally. So it's about what you want your own people to kind of internalize. Um, and national anthems are a common point of reference. Everyone knows the music, even if they don't know all the words. Um, and it's music that's owned by the people. There's kind of an infinite number of ways to arrange a national anthem. It's not like there's a cover of the national anthem. There's sort of an infinite range there. Um, and it's, it's really that kind of common point of reference and that the emotion that's tied to these songs that makes them so important also makes them a focal point for protest. So in the news um, past couple of years, um, Colin Kaepernick protesting um, with Black Lives Matter, you know, that's the national anthem is super emotive. It's a symbol everyone, it's something everyone relates to in some way. And, um, you know, if you look at the uproar that happened on the American right over this, you know, people felt this was an affront. Um, but at the same time, for the message, it's a super powerful symbol. Same thing happened in the 1968 um, Summer Olympics with the Black Power salute. Um, that picture in the middle, that was um, a mass booing of the Chinese national anthem in Hong Kong. Um, you know, they turned their backs, they held up these signs that said, boo, Hong Kong is not China. And the Hong Kong protest movement has actually adopted a national anthem of its own. Um, and you know, the, it, it just gives you a sense of how emotive and um, and kind of powerful these songs should be. And I guess with that in mind, it, it makes it worth knowing a little bit about them. And that is all from me. Thank you for listening and um, happy for any questions. Thank you. That was um, brilliant. And I am just so delighted by the fact that you took time to make charts in Excel. Um, <laughs> Speaker's privilege. Um, can I ask a question? How did you decide whether something was a hymn or a march or a hymn march hybrid? Did you march to it? Uh, in kind of in my head, most I mean, mostly like if you're listening to like say 200 national anthems, one starts playing and you're like, okay, that's a hymn. There, there were some of them that were kind of close, and you're like, mm. so I'll be honest that 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 was that was down to me. That's as scientific okay. as it got. <laughs> and then, and then, second question for me, and then I'll stop abusing my uh, host privilege. Um, so when you were presenting on slides, on, on flags, you, um, I think you talked about this guy's sort of criteria for judging what a good um, flag is. Yes. When you were talking about the, the French national anthem and, and you said it's obviously the best. And, and then the Argentinian one, you said that anything that can get people tapping along before the words even start. So what would be your criteria for, for assessing the best national anthem um... framework analysis? So, I mean, it, with, with flags, there's kind of a, a field of study on that, and that doesn't exist for national anthems. So, for me, I mean, I guess you want yeah. something that is, in a way, you, you know, that gets people excited, that makes people feel like that makes people feel like you want them to feel by singing or hearing their national anthem. I think that's that's the key. You don't necessarily need to be able to sing along the Latin American anthems the lyrics like totally it's not like how you would speak spanish and they slur things together and it's just it's a mess so you don't necessarily need to be able to sing along but if uh if listening to a national anthem makes you feel like yes that's i'd say that's a good national anthem i don't know that god save the queen necessarily does this maybe it did in 1745 but but it's got history on its side so <laughs> um uh, Susie, do we have any more questions from the audience? Sorry, I was on mute there. Um, yes, we have absolutely heaps of questions. Let me ask the first one. Um, <clears throat> are there any countries that are multilingual, but the anthem is in only one language? Yes. Um, so Malaysia, for example, uh, or sorry, Singapore, for example, um, is multilingual, but the national anthem is only in Malay. Um, but the, the whole language question is, is actually quite interesting. Um, different countries do different things. Um, Canada's national anthem was actually written in French um, and then translated into English. Uh, Ireland's anthem was written in English, but mostly sung in Irish, even though something like only 20% of the Irish population are, are fluent in Gaelic. It's almost always sung in Irish. Um, Belgium has three versions that are mostly the same. Switzerland has four versions that are totally different. Um, 
Afghanistan has to be sung is is only in Pashtu, and that's that's in their law. However, stressing the unity of their country, like more than half of their anthem is just a list of ethnicities. They list like 14 different national groups. Mm. Cool. Thank you very much. Um, so we've had a couple of questions around this theme. So if any countries got really modern national anthems and or any that picked by the people of the country so we were thinking like Eurovision or you know just like a popular song that kind of thing so there there have been quite loads of countries have done kind of a competition to decide what the national anthem is going to be but it's not usually been down to popular vote um like Mexico for example the great th this poet uh said he was a love poet and he couldn't write a national anthem and his wife lures him into bed and then locks him in the bedroom and says, you're not coming out until you write a national anthem. That's their great myth. Um, but uh, in terms of modern national anthems, I t not especially, I, I mean, Nepal is interesting. Um, if, you, if you guys remember about 15 years ago that, that Nepal had a big civil war and someone like shot up the whole royal family if you remember, there were videos of it and stuff. Um, Nepal got rid of their monarchy and they decided they needed a new national anthem and they have the only national anthem that was um, composed on a Casio keyboard and the official, mm. the official um, like version of this national anthem is still on a Casio keyboard. So, <laughs> so Casio keyboard, very modern. Yeah. <laughs> um, so are there any countries that have like weird punishments related to anthems? So like... Being fined if you don't sing it properly or fined if you don't stand up, that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, um, it, essentially, the less democratic a country is, the more likely that is to happen, is the, the short answer to that. I mean, one of the, one of the things that's happened just in, uh, like, I think May this year was uh, legislation was introduced in Hong Kong uh, requiring the national anthem to be sung in schools and saying it's, um, it's a criminal offense to treat it disrespectfully, which um, led to protests and stuff. So, yeah. Mm. Um, definitely the more authoritarian the country is the more likely that is to be the case okay um are there any national anthems written by expats or immigrants to the country or even like non-residents um y yes i'm sure uh so yeah actually so um paraguay and uruguay were written by the same guy um both great anthems, by the way. Um, uh, Bangladesh and India, uh, the same um, the same poet wrote the lyrics. Um, so you, yeah, you don't necessarily have to be from the country. Um, actually, the Het Wilhelmus, the Dutch anthem, was probably written by someone from Antwerp who had fled north. Mm. Okay, let me go back on the chat. Um... <laughs> Is it, I don't know if you'll know this one. Is it true that in the Olympics, the Kazakhstan anthem was displayed by displayed as the anthem from Borat? I don't think it was in the Olympics that this happened, but this did apparently actually happen at a diplomatic function, which is maybe worse or maybe better, <laughs> um, less televised. But I don't believe that. I, I am I'm sure it wasn't at the Olympics that that happened, but it, it did actually happen at some point. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay um are there any length limits or can you go on for as long as you want with them nope um so het wilhelmus is actually 15 uh stanzas long um so that's pretty long uh mm -hmm. but but like most anthems have a lot more verses than are actually normally sung so god save the queen has three um that are regularly sung or that that are regularly considered to be the anthem it's actually just de facto it's not in law that this is the national anthem um there are some really long ones i think um uruguay is something like 156 lines of music or something like that i, th I think that's the longest musically so no there's no length limit um yeah cool okay i think we'll make this on the last one um do you have any views on why Americans tend to stand and listen to their anthem being sung by a singer, whereas others are kind of more of a group effort? Um, hmm. It, 
it might so like uh, obviously as as an american i don't know that that's actually necessarily an american well it, it might be sort of an american phenomenon i mean part of it is sort of the commercialization of sport and the fact that the national anthem is sung at the beginning of most uh sports games so it's kind of an opportunity to get yourself out there by singing the national anthem um but i i mean i would say uh the the uk and and western europe are probably more exceptions in their lack of knowledge or lack of caring about their own national anthems mm -hmm. a lot a lot of countries it's it's a big deal and people care about them um so uh yeah so but for america it's yeah it's probably down to money i mean it is america so yeah <laughs> um i'm actually going to sneak a set a, fi a final final question in because a number of people have just asked to do it um can you tell us a little bit more about the outliers from southeast asia i think people are interested in the like wacky ones yeah so the, i mean i i classify them as outliers because they don't really fit into march or hymn or opera um india pakistan not Pakistan, sorry, uh, India, Bangladesh um, are are both, if you listen to like, if you listen to it sung with sort of traditional music, it works really well and it's super poetic. There's some great imagery in there. Bangladesh talks about like my mother Bangladesh and it, there's something about like the mango trees in spring and so the, and they're they're just really interesting japan's kind of an outlier um it's the oldest text actually that's from like the 700s but it's um it, it's it was only put to music in like the 1880s but that sounds japanese so i guess the outliers are sort of those countries that sort of sound like you think they should sound instead of a mm -hmm. generic march i'm not sure why they're largely confined to south southeast asia there's sort of a small pseudo east african group as well if you're sort of familiar with ethiopian music you can listen to ethiopia and eritrea and be like oh okay i, I sort of get that but there are also marches at the same time cool thank you very much thank you susie and um thank you andrew that was absolutely brilliant um, final question, just before we take a break. When you arranged these flags behind you, did you arrange them so that your like favorite flags are visible or is it just random? Were you oh, able yeah. to just let the flag fall as they as they fall? Or? Uh, of course not. No, it's <laughs> yes, it's all it's all manicured. It's all <laughs> manicured. I realized, you know, Saudi Arabia was above France and I had to I had to switch that around because, uh, you know, my Saudi Arabia's national anthem is garbage. You know, <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> um. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was great. Um, really, um, really delighted to learn all of that. I'm also really delighted that the tech works. 